Dear Mr. Goyer, go fuck yourself. Yesterday the internet blew up with news about an interview with David S. Goyer and several others on the Script Notes podcast. It was part of a panel called The Summer Superhero Spectacular with Andrea Berloff, Christopher Marcus, and Stephen McFeely. To say that Goyer and the host stuck their feet in their mouths would be an understatement of epic proportions. At one point, the subject of She-Hulk came up, and the following exchange happened. It's yeah, the most demeaning she has character yeah. name it, it is, yeah. honestly... You're just the female version of She-Hulk, the She-Hulk, the real name for She-Hulk was Slut-Hulk. That was yeah. the whole point. was like, let's just make a green chick with enormous boobs, and she's Hulk strong, but not Hulk massive, right? No. So, like... Hulk's muscle. Well, she does tone. Pilates. She gets the strength without she, yeah, she's the. She's real yeah. lean, yeah. stringy, and just she's hot. Still and, pretty chunky. I mean, she was like she's, China. She's from like the a WWE size 16. Dude. Player. Yeah. No, she wasn't. Like, she Hulk. The whole point of She Hulk was just to appeal sexistly to ten-year-old boys. Worked on. I have a theory about She Hulk, which was created by a man, right? Mm-hmm. And at the time, in particular, I think ninety-five percent of comic book readers were men, and certainly almost all of the comic book writers were men. So the Hulk was this classic male power fantasy. It's like most of the people reading comic books were these people like me who were just these little kids who were getting the shit beaten out of them every day. And they're like, what if I became giant and could clap my hands and create a sonic boom? And so then they created She-Hulk, right, who was still smart. So it was like, I think She-Hulk is the chick that you could fuck if you were Hulk. Right. You know what I'm saying? No. No, I'm just saying <laughs> She-Hulk was the extension of the male power fantasy. So it's like if I'm going to yeah. be this geek that becomes the Hulk, yeah. then let's create a giant green porn star yeah. that only the Hulk could fuck. Or me. Or This is problematic on a number of levels. Now, I don't expect everyone to be up to date on every superhero, their origins, and their place in their respective universes to current, but I also don't expect people who don't know what they're talking about to opine on things that they clearly know nothing about, and I don't think that's an unreasonable expectation. Yes, She-Hulk is named as basically a female counterpart to the popular Incredible Hulk, but to suggest that she is nothing other than a sexualized version of the Great Green Behemoth is to have never read any of the character, who is a vastly different person. Yes, her costume is tight and her proportions the type of thing that entices young boys, but her character is assertive, clever, and much, much different from her cousin Bruce. She has her own stories, her own feel, and her own themes that have nothing to do with the pathos-laden Incredible Hulk book. Further, very little irritates me more than when people appropriate concepts and language that they don't understand to make points that are the opposite of what those terms actually mean. This is very little more than concern trolling, pretending to care about female representation in comics as an excuse to call a female character a slut and insult her body type. Listen to how they seem to think that She-Hulk is supposed to be a male sexual fantasy and that she's chunky, and something for the male power fantasy that is the Hulk to merely fuck. It's rare for a female character to both be created to be overweight as Goyer bafflingly contends, and to be an object of desire based on looks alone. The thing is, She-Hulk is sexy, and that comes as much from her personality and actions as it does from her body type, something that these two don't seem to know anything about. But that's not all in this wretched interview. When asked about the DC character Martian Manhunter, a character that Goyer will likely have control over writing, he said the following. How many people in the audience have heard of Martian Manhunter? We have a good audience. He's overpowered. How many people that raised their hands have ever been laid? (laughs) (laughs) Well... He can't be fucking called the Martian Manhunter because that's goofy. He could be called Manhunter. Once again, we see Goyer views comics as nothing but sexual fantasies for young men. The utter contempt with which he addresses fans of a character that is a staple of the Justice League and present in not only comics, but Bruce Timm's incredibly popular Justice League and Justice League Unlimited series is not quite shocking. But obviously, the view of an outsider who sees comic fans as nothing but lonely man-children who got into comics to live out vicariously the heroic popularity that they are otherwise incapable of achieving. As my friend Dex, who informed me of this interview, pointed out, this is one of the reasons why DC movies continue to be critical and fan flops. Stanley, in an interview with Kevin Smith well over a decade ago, told the following story. One funny thing, I must say, when we started out selling them... Mm-hmm. I had heard that they, because I knew people at the company, right. that they used to have meetings and wonder, why, why is Marvel outselling us? Mm-hmm. And some genius would get up and say, I think it's because Stan uses a lot of dialogue balloons on the covers. <laughs> so the minute I would hear that, 
for the next few months, I'd take all the dialogue fluids off the covers. <laughs> right. Or they'd say, because we use a lot of red on our covers. So for the next few months, no red on the covers. <laughs> right. It must have driven them crazy. And I never could understand why it didn't occur to them that we were trying to talk to the readers mm -hmm. instead of just doing stories. Right. You know? And I think that was the main thing. And you involved? Even back then, DC was looking for the formula for fan attention, as if it's a secret trick to selling comic books and associated properties. It's not. The trick, of all things, is to make good stories with interesting characters that readers care about. The trick to making good movies out of comics is to focus on what people love about these characters and write a movie that brings out those traits. Part of the reason why Marvel is dominating the box office is that, quite frankly, the people involved clearly love what they're doing. Samuel L. Jackson was excited to be the basis for Ultimate Nick Fury and jumped at the chance to bring the character to life. Vin Diesel fought for months just to be able to voice over three words in the upcoming Guardians of the Galaxy movie. These ones. I'm rude. Even Anthony Mackie, who plays the Falcon in Captain America the Winter Soldier, didn't know much about the character but learned quickly and started to love him. Which isn't to say that this is entirely absent from the DC side. Heath Ledger literally killed himself trying to get into the Joker's head, and the greatest tragedy is that his sacrifice resulted in the best portrayal of a DC cinematic character to date, a part that would have led to a stellar career in all likelihood. I defended in a text blog post the casting of Ben Affleck as Batman, since he is a gigantic fan who knows this character very, very well, and if the movie fails, I suspect it will not be because he didn't give the best performance he could with what was written by this goofball Goyer. Goyer, Nolan, Schneider, and the people at Warner Brothers seemed genuinely humiliated to be making superhero movies. Instead of the bright, remarkable films we're getting from Marvel, we're instead getting grim apologies like the joyless and flaccid Batman trilogy in Man of Steel. Batman could hide it fairly well for two films, at least, but Superman is about nothing but joy, and they sucked every last drop out of it except for the brief scene where he was learning to fly, my favorite in the film. You see, Mr. Goyer, so long as you continue to hold your archaic and stereotypical view of the fans you're trying to sell to, you're sure to continue to make dead, lifeless fare that solidifies the opinion that DC is a universe suited only to television, where they're succeeding at least in part due to not having nitwits like you at the helm. Sure, you can ignore the fans on this one and continue to sneer at us, but we're not the ones opening a movie opposite Age of Ultron. Just saying. Sequentially yours, Karu. As long as I can remember, I haven't looked for you I haven't looked for you all my days As long as I can remember, I haven't looked for you And all this while you were waiting along the way So let this be a testimony how far I would go to bring you home And let each day be a victory And the sweetest time that we've ever known Quédate, por favor Por favor, quédate conmigo Hasta ansia, vaya hasta, vaya hasta, hasta ansia, se me no, no. 